Hello everyone, there we go, got it working. Uh, today we're talking about the rise of the totalitarian regime. Um, the early 20th century is one of the most horrific time periods in world history to study. Uh, and unfortunately it wasn't too long ago. You might have uh, grandparents that you know, or great-grandparents that were alive during this time period. And really, this time period is one of tragedy for a large portion of the world, okay? Uh, first, we're going to be talking about communism, okay? Communism was founded by a man named Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. And Marx lived in a time period in Europe that was industrializing and growing. And the Industrial Revolution globally brought a lot of pain and suffering for a lot of people. Uh, before labor unions and labor laws, there were a lot of serious problems with labor and um, the economic situation of individuals and, and healthcare and being able to provide for your family. And, there were a lot of a lot of issues, and so Marx comes up with this idea upon seeing the horrible working conditions of people in in factories. Um, he sees how hundreds of people are working, uh, you know, long hours for you know impoverished wages, having serious economic issues, while making the factory owners, owners rich. Um, and he saw that the poor had no legal protection, health care, insurance, employment benefits, welfare. They had nothing, really. So he thought long and hard about what the whole capitalist system um, and defined the problems and came up with a possible solution. He published his books in a book called The Communist Manifesto uh, in 1848. Really interesting read. It's... Uh, it's more of a philosophical work than anything else, but is it, it is an economic theory uh, predominantly in that it proposes, here's Karl Marx, he proposes that instead of people being able to buy and sell whatever they want uh, for however much they want in a completely free market, that the market be controlled by the government and people work in their ideal job for what they're best suited at, and the state decides that. Nope, go backwards. Okay, communist principles. What is the source of evil and suffering in the world? It's the rich and powerful exploiting the poor and the helpless. The, the rich are blamed for basically everything. Uh, what is the source of power and wealth of the rich? The land and unfair distribution of wealth. So the idea behind communism is to distribute wealth evenly amongst the population. Um, and therefore, individual land ownership is wrong, according to Marx. Private property ownership is wrong. Being rich is wrong. Making a profit is wrong. A just and fair government should abolish all private property, and no one can become rich, greedy, and powerful. And, you know, this is a propaganda poster from the time. This is the greedy capitalist, you know, surrounded by a dragon horde where he loves golden, you know, gold, and he's surrounded by industry. And um, he is the spider at the center of a web here. It's, you know, this is communist propaganda basically saying that capitalists are evil. Okay, under communism, the government owns... Property, cars, housing, apartments, farms, businesses, everything, okay? Everyone works for the state. Everyone belongs to the government. The government controls all wages, uh, what jobs you get. The state is responsible for making everything equal. The state is more important than the individual. And this specific ideology leads to some of the greatest tragedy that has ever happened to with humanity. Um, Stalin, we'll talk about later, took this ideology and 
really ran with it. The idea that the state is more important than the individual, uh, he really took liberty with in that individuals were not important and therefore disposable. And so millions were sent to uh, the gulags. Um, if you ever get a chance to read Solzhenitsyn's, Sins, um, might be pronouncing that wrong, um, the Gulag Ar Archipelago, it is very enlightening um, as to just the absolute horrors of this type of ideology. Okay? Um, happiness is found through obedience to the state, since they know what is best for you. Happiness is not found through produce, pursuit of freedom, which leads to oppression. So with just these two statements, um, communist ideology is com in complete opposition to American idealism in regards to free, freedom and free, a free market economy. Um, even going into the end of World War II, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but before the war even ended, uh, the Americans were wargaming against the Soviet Union because they knew that the philosophies which controlled our government were directly opposed to that of the communists who were in charge of what was Russia, which became the Soviet Union, which is now Russia again. Okay. This is the type of architecture that you see in the Soviet Union. It is uh, what we call today the brutalist style, where everything is the same and uniform and not meant for individual pleasure or enjoyment to look at or enjoy. It's made for utility and function. And that's really it. Um, and that's kind of the Soviet period in a nutshell. And you get uh, small little terrible cars that are just cheaply made to run. You know what, actually? Yeah, Polsky Fiat. Um, these are Fiats, which are French. I might have the wrong picture in here. I apologize for that. Anyways, yeah, Russian cars were terrible. Those are Russian cars. Anyways, um, but another huge problem that you have is uh, buying anything. So the state controls everything. And with that comes a control of farms and produce. But not only that, but the production of everything. Um, I had a friend in college who grew up in an ex-Soviet state. And he asked me to uh, take him to the store because he needed a new pen. Singular, pen. Uh, he would use a pen until it was didn't have any ink anymore, and then he would purchase another one. And so I took him to Walmart because it was close and it was cheap, and he had never been to a Walmart before. And he walks in, and he looks at the pen aisle, and he looks around, looks around, looks around, and I'm just standing next to him, and just waiting patiently, and he, he takes a solid two minutes to just stare at the pens, and he doesn't say a word. And eventually, he swears, he says a swear word, and he just starts storming out. And I didn't say anything, because I, I realized he was very upset. And I walk after him, and we end up getting in the car, and I start the car, and we start driving back to campus, because I could just tell by his body language, he just wanted to get out of there. And we're driving on the way home, and he says, where I'm from, there's one pen. One pen! That's it. If I go to a store to buy a pen, there is one pen. There are no choices. There is one pen. He was so overwhelmed by the possibility of choice, he was unable to make one because he was completely unused to it. This is shopping in the Soviet Union. I mean, you, there is one pen. There is one whatever it is. You want to buy chicken? There is the, a chicken. There is. And in, in very limited supply because uh, 
the people who are producing these things are completely unmotivated to actually produce them at high quantities because there's no profit to be had. So you essentially have a workforce that works the absolute minimum amount possible to not get thrown in prison because they're not contributing to the state. And that's really about it. So productivity is very low. Um, quantities of things are basically kept at hopefully what the people need and that's about it. Um, here's another image. I mean, this is a, a butcher in, in, in an in American or an Italian or, you know, most other European or an Asian like butcher market. I mean, this would be packed with like beautiful meats and cheeses and things like that to get you to want to purchase their goods. But in, there's no need for incentive in the Soviet Union because everything is the same. And in order to survive, you have to purchase the state's goods. And that's really about it. Okay? Under communism, everyone makes nearly the same wages. There's no need for competition, for profit in the marketplace. Therefore, prices are very low. Wages are low as well. This is not a problem. There's no landlord, so rents are low. There's no unemployment. The government guarantees everyone jobs, based on ability. Uh, and how do they determine it? ability school test results so if you're an absolute genius you might become rocket scientists whereas uh, if your intellectual capacity is is lower than others you might end up you know sweeping floors for the rest of your life um, the smartest children get free college education become doctors engineers scientists etc the next level of achiever, achievers get trained to be clerks managers bookkeepers average achievers labor, low achievers, heavy manual labor, okay? And so you have Soviet, you know, heavy labor jobs where basically you make big rocks and a little rocks until you die. Um, if you're not, you know, an extremely intellectual person, okay? Uh, the government oversees all this. If there are too many dick jiggers, you could be transferred to a construction site and so forth. So there's no set job that you have for the rest of your life you might be lucky and fortunate and, and stay in one place so you're by your family and things like that but you could also be moved from one province to another or from one you know one one place to another based on the government's need or perceived need now, some people have nicer clothes than others would be making a statement they feel superior to others while others should stay equal uh, luxury items are un unnecessary. There's no need for jewelry stores, fancy clothes, etc. Factories, factories producing a variety of clothing styles is a waste of money. This is the this is the thing I was I was talking about with the one pen. So luxury items are essentially viewed as being a capitalist like horrible thing, with the exception of the uh, political elite that still partook in these types of things. Uh, memory factories are owned by the state, produce only what the government tells them to produce. Okay. Um, I add this picture because also you're working in conditions where there are no safety regulations whatsoever. Um, if you got caught in this type of gearing, I mean, you're going to lose a limb at the very least. You're probably going to die. And um, so not only are you working for basically just enough to survive, but you're working in conditions where it's very dangerous oftentimes. And if you speak out or complain against the government at all, you could be sent to the gulag system, which is a prison system, uh, where typically they would torture you, get you to sign a confession by doing things like depriving you of sleep for days at a time and then um, under this essentially faulty confession they would send you to a prison camp for you know 20 40 you know years if you're lucky you'd get a five or ten something with something crazy and um, you make big rocks and little rocks you do heavy labor until you die essentially 
uh, working in the uh, part of this prison system. A lot of these locations for the prison were in, you know, the, the Siberian tundra where there's, uh, you know, and forests where it's extremely cold and, and remote and hard to survive at the best of times. But then you're in a prison, prison and you're being underfed and it was just absolutely terrible. And so you, know, you either just put up with what was going on and didn't complain about it or there's a chance that you could be sent to the gulag to die um, and this was supposed to be a utopian society uh, if everything worked according to plan everyone's happy and working their perfect job um, there's no cost for medical care or you know really anything because ever the state handles all, all problems in your life. There's no war, poverty, racism. Co uh, communism opposes and eradicates corrupt evil systems such as monarchies and democracies. And everything is sunshine and rainbows. Except it's not. Because this is more likely where you'd end up if you ran into problems and you complained about anything. Uh, there was a system where you would be rewarded for uh, reporting on your neighbors to the KGB, the the the, the secret police. And people, and people were terrified of saying anything because their neighbors could report on them. And there was this thought and fear that the government had, you know, bugged and planted wires in your your walls and your apartment buildings and were listening to everything you said. And people were terrified. Um, and rightfully so, because millions went to the Gulag. Uh, it was just absolutely a horrifying experience. Okay, and the fatal flaw of communism, um, because it's not built around a system that takes human nature into account. Um, there's no, no motivation for wanting to work hard or to improve, improve your life, because there's no benefit to you if you do so. All factory workers get paid the same, whether you're hard or the bare minimum. Um, so one of two things can happen. Everyone sees your great example and is inspired by it to uh, inspired to copy you. So if you work really hard, everyone's going to follow along. Um, this does work sometimes, especially during emergencies. Um, you know, where there's a war on uh, and you've got a patriotic, nationalistic you know, mantra being pushed, you might get people to work harder um, based on examples but it's not nearly as common as everyone just doing barely enough to get by excuse me which do you think is the most likely outcome and that's doing barely enough to get by take farmers for another example they no longer own their land farmers traditionally take huge huge pride in the crops they produce. Uh, they must grow what the state tells them now and how much to grow. And so instead of the farm being owned by the farmer and that farm being, you know, their entire world, now it's just a state run thing that they go work on and there's no incentive to, you know, produce high yield crops that they're going to sell in, in, in the market. There's starvation and famine that uh, result of that, this. Um, no bonuses in, or incentives for growing more food. Productivity falls and the state must use threats or force to increase it. And shifting the blame begins. Farmer can't grow enough food because he can't get enough spare parts for his tractor because the factory production is down. And you end up with a situation where uh, this, you know, meme is it, it kind of sums things up. You've got a series of communists from, you know, Marx to Lenin to Stalin to to to, to Mao, where you've got five guys, no food, and everyone dies. I mean, you've got severe shortages of food because. No one is motivated to actually work and do and, and produce high yields for, for anything, and so you don't have enough food to go around. It was just absolutely horrible in a lot of these countries. Um, Soviet Union and the United States. So like I said earlier, towards the end of World War II, and we're kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but I'm, I'm 
trying to sum up communism um, and some of these totalitarian re regimes. Should not come as a surprise that our relationship with communist, uh, communist Russia is tense and distrustful because of you know what I stated earlier. The socioeconomic, political, and you know, philosophical ideals that are that our nations were founded on are completely opposed to one another. One is says, you know, freedom is the most important. One says, you know, uh, it's the state that is the most important thing and, you know, equality. During the 1920s, they were recovering from multiple disasters of World War I, the Spanish flu, ask, Spanish flu outbreak, um, estimated between 50 and 100 million deaths worldwide, um, civil war, in the Soviet Union, famine in the Soviet Union, 1930s, slowly gaining military strength and power at the expense of people who remained poor. Um, and you've got a lot of people who were very angry and upset at uh, the government. During the 1940s, they were first allied with Nazi Germany, but then Hitler turned on them, uh, forced to be allied with us in order to defeat Hitler. Uh, Sorry if you heard that. My dog was scratching her face. Now she's settling back in. Uh, they were forced to be allied with us in order to defeat Hitler. The trouble started at the moment World War II ended. The United States and the Soviet Union, very powerful militarily. We built up these huge militaries and were completely opposed to another ideologically. Some of the major areas of disagreement are what to do with Germany after the war. What to do with countries of Europe under Soviet control, countries under Soviet control were like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, East Germany, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, um, and some in the Soviet Union is conquering new territories like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Um, and you see this distinct contrast between some place like East or Western Berlin. This is the communist or uh, the the capitalist area that you know America had conquered, and then the brutalist style in the East, where the Soviet Union is rebuilding and everything is the same. Okay, and the U the USSR, the Soviet Union, was huge. Um, there was a reason why the West and America specifically, but also the, Euro the other European countries were um, terrified of, of the Soviet Union and fought numerous wars to um, stave off the Soviet advances because they were so ideologically opposed, but also because the Soviet Union was huge and expanding and trying to expand further. All of these, this area and these countries, you know, ended up falling under Soviet control. Okay, some neighboring countries tried to conquer, but uh, did not succeed. Finland, Greece, Turkey, etc. Um, and thus the Cold War begins, a time of hostility and opposing one another while uh, almost coming to, to all-out war several times. Now, there were wars that happened, but, you know, the Vietnam War was not a full-scale war between the Soviet Union and the United States of America. And that would have been a very, very different war. Uh, both sides acquired nuclear weapons, which really complicated things. Now the consequences of war with the Soviet Union would uh, be World War III and an end of civilization, if we know it. And, and like during the Cuban Missile Crisis in America, like the world almost ended. In that incident, in, uh, incident you have the Soviet Union who um, gave or lent nuclear weapons to Cuba that could attack the Eastern Seaboard, and John F. Kennedy was recommended by his, you know, Joint Chiefs of Staff to fire nuclear weapons in a preliminary strike against the Soviet Union, which would have caused them in turn to fire their nuclear weapons, and at that time the nuclear capabilities of both of our countries combined, if we fired off all of our nuclear weapons, would 
throw the world into a nuclear winter and essentially kill all life on the planet. Like, everyone would have died. It would have been the end of civilization. Um, just absolutely horrifying. And this is one of the reasons why it never came to pass, because the world leaders from both sides of the fence realized that if we do this for real, um, no one wins, and pretty much everyone dies. I mean, even if you escape to some underground bum bunker, you might be hiding out there for 50 years and have multiple generations hiding out in this nuclear bunk bunker waiting for civilization to be able to poke its head back back out uh, like a you know groundhog on groundhog day. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Okay, um, we come, like I said, we come very close to nuclear war several times. You know, the most famous of this being the, the nuclear missile crisis, uh, you know, uh, the Cuban missile crisis, excuse me. Okay, so you've got the United States, Europe and the Soviet Union who are vying for territory in places like Cuba, Europe, Germany, East and West Germany, uh, Korea, and Vietnam. That's what these places represent. Okay? Uh, and then there's this fear of atomic attack and bombs and, and nuclear shelters. And, and uh, it's interesting, I was in the, the U.S. Army and they still do nuclear drills as, as, as late as a, a get out in 2014. And they were still doing nuclear attacks and basic training, which was just crazy to me. Because what, what they train soldiers to do is, is if you see a nuclear bomb, lay straight down on your belly and point your helmet at the, at the nuclear blast. And hopefully it'll minimize the damage. You know, and if you're close enough, it's... You're, you're going to die. I mean, it, these things are, these weapons are just absolutely terrifying. Okay. And we're going to stop the video there for the day and pick it up again in the second part of this series.